This video will discuss how to construct exponential functions and also use the growth and decay formulas to solve word problems. Let's get into it. So here's some stuff you should already know. You should know some things about linear functions. They are in the form y equals mx plus b. And on a graph, this function makes a straight line going forever in both directions. You should also know a few things about quadratic functions. These functions have a standard form that says y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And then the graph, it makes a shape called a parabola. So now for what this entire video is about, exponential relationships. These functions have the form y equals a times b to the power of x. And on a graph, you get a shape that looks like this. Notice how the line is going up, but at a faster rate as it moves more to the right. Notice how the blue line is closer to the x-axis on the left side of the graph, and then way above the x-axis on the right side of the graph. This is what an exponential situation looks like, and we will explore examples shortly. Before we get to that, let's make sure we remember some examples of linear and quadratic situations so that we can understand why exponential functions are different. A very common situation for the y value is to have it be the cost of something. The mx part is usually some price being multiplied by some number of items that you're buying. And then the plus b part is usually an initial value that's added on. And that initial value is always the y-intercept, which is b. The price is the slope, which is always in rise over run form. The unit sold would be the input x value, and the corresponding output y value is going to be the cost. Now, quadratic examples are a little different. Things like the flight of a baseball when it's hit, a rocket being launched and flying through the air, a pendulum swinging back and forth. These shapes all make parabolas. It's also important to note that the y-intercept is the value of c. So in both linear and quadratic models, we can easily find the y-intercept. The same is true for exponential functions, which we will now examine. Something like bacteria growing over time is an exponential situation. Bacteria multiply very quickly, so it's not linear or quadratic. A viral social media post gaining likes and views at an exponential pace. Once a few people see a post and like it, if it's really good and people start liking it really quickly, then the social media app will show it to more and more people, who will then start viewing it and liking it, just like how bacteria can grow and multiply very quickly. Hence the term viral video. And then lastly, another common example is how a population can grow for a species of animal that reproduces quite frequently. Rabbits, mice, gerbils. These animals have populations that can really boom when left unchecked. And then one last thing before we move on, the y-intercept in the exponential function is always in the position of a, the number in front without the exponent. I'll even say that again. The Exponential function is always going, or the y-intercept in the exponential function is always the number in the position of a, the number in front without the exponent. So you can now see that in all three of these forms, you are able to find the y-intercept, which is the initial value in the equation before doing any work. All right, so here's what you need to know before we do some practice problems. This is the main teaching slide, so listen carefully. Here's an example of exponential form again. f of x equals the initial value a times the common ratio b, which is raised to the power of x. In addition to being the initial value, a is also the y-intercept, which is the y value when x is equal to 0. Now, b is the common ratio. It's the factor that you multiply by for each increase in the x value. Now, the x value that's in the exponent, that is your input. That's where you will be plugging in numbers to solve. And f of x, which is the same thing as y, represents your output value. As a quick reminder, you will sometimes see these problems with a y or an f of x and with or without parentheses, but just keep in mind they all mean the same thing. Now let's check out an easy example to see what a table, graph, and function that's exponential looks like. Here's example one. You perform an experiment in science class in which you start with 100 bacteria, and the amount of bacteria doubles every hour. Let's highlight what's important. There are 100 bacteria, and they double every hour. Those are your A and B values, the initial value and common ratio. First, let's see how this looks in a table. We have T as the input variable for time, and B of T as the output variable for the number of bacteria. We know that at the start of this experiment, when zero hours have passed, T equals zero means 100 bacteria were present. 
Following the pattern of doubling each hour, after one hour, there are now 200 bacteria, since 100 doubled is 200. Continuing this pattern, after two hours, there are 400 bacteria. After three hours, there's 800, and so on and so forth. Now, the graph of this situation is easy to draw, but the shape of the line is what really matters. Let's put time on the x-axis and the number of bacteria on the y-axis. And now let's plot our points starting with 0, 100. It's the small green dot on the graph that I'm putting back and forth right now for you to see. The next point, 1, 200, is slightly above, then 2, 400 is a little higher, then 3, 800 is still a little higher, and if you keep going with plotting more and more dots, it gets much higher, and it makes the exponential shape when you draw the line through it. Lastly, Let's take a look at what the function for the situation would look like in its equation form. We'll start with b of t. The initial value is 100, so a is 100. And then since it said doubling in the prompt, we multiply by 2 and raise that to the power of x. And that's it. Being able to understand these three versions of exponential functions will help you in the problems to come. Let's do another example. Use the table and graph to answer the questions below. And let's start with number one. What does A represent? Well, we know from this lesson so far that it's the initial value, which means it's the starting point. So let's look at where the x value is 0. And we can see that the output of y is the number 4. So that means A is going to equal 4. Number two asks you for the meaning of b, which is the common ratio. That's the number that takes you from one output value to the next by multiplying. And we can see in the table to the left that from 4 to 12 and then from 12 to 36, we are multiplying by 3. That's the pattern, which is how we will now know that b is equal to 3. So now let's write the equation in the form y equals a times b to the power of x. We start with y equals. Instead of a, we write 4. Instead of b, we write 3 times 3 to the power of x. And that's it. Let's look at another one. Here we are just writing the function based on the table and graph. Again, we know that the exponential form is y equals a times b to the power of x. Well, what is a? Since a is the initial value, which is the y-intercept, which always has the x value of 0 associated with it, we can see that a equals 50. Notice how on the graph we can also see that the coordinate 0, 50 is right there on the y-axis. The value of b, the common ratio, we can get that by noticing that each of the output values are getting doubled. So that means we are multiplying by 2. Putting it all together, we have y equals 50 times 2 to the power of x. So this next example has a couple for you to try. Consider pausing the video right now and trying to get these ones before I explain them. So we can see in part A that the graph crosses the y-axis at 0 0.5, meaning the initial value is 0 0.5, so that is A. To get B in this one, we need to really think about how we are going to multiply to go from 0 0.5 to 3. Notice how the next coordinate has an output value of 3. I'm pointing to it with that blue arrow in the problem. The pattern we are trying to identify makes 0 0.5 become 3 when you multiply it by some number. Not sure how to figure that out? Well, just do the opposite. Divide 3 by 0 0.5 to figure out what number would multiply 0 0.5 to give you 3. This is just an inverse operation step. That answer would, of course, be 6. And you can literally check that right now by just typing into a calculator 0 0.5 times 6. And notice how you get 3 as the output. Putting it all together, we have y equals 0 0.5 times 6 to the power of x for the final answer. In part b, we can start off by seeing that a equals 16 since the x value is 0. As for b, you'll notice the output values are getting smaller by a half, meaning you would be dividing by 2. But the thing is, and this is very important, so tune in if you are starting to space out right now, the value of b has to be the number that you multiply by to establish the pattern, not divide. So the question now becomes, what do you multiply 32 by to make it into a 16? What do you multiply 16 by to make it become an 8? 
If it's not obvious, then just do a 16 divided by 32, and you'll get 0 0.5. Check that again by doing 4 divided by 8, you still get 0 0.5. So that means dividing by 2 is the same thing as multiplying by 0 0.5 or 1 half, which is going to become our value for B. Putting it all together, we get the answer of 16 times 0 0.5, or you could use the 1 half, and then raise that to the power of x. Okay, one more of these examples and then we'll move on. Consider pausing the video once more and trying these first, and I'm going to explain them very quickly for the sake of saving some time. So a is equal to 24. For b, you'll notice the pattern is getting smaller. 24 is becoming 8, and that means you're dividing by 3. So thinking back to the previous example, if dividing by 2 means you're really multiplying by 1 half, then dividing by 3 must mean you're multiplying by 1 third, which is the value of b. So putting it together, we have 24 times 1 third to the power of x as the final answer. For part b, it's easy to notice that a equals 5. You got to be careful with b, though. Taking 135 and dividing by 45 will give you 3, and you'll also notice that the x values skip the number 1, meaning if you took 5 times 3, you would get 15, and then 15 times 3 would give you 45. So that makes the b value 3 in this situation. Putting it all together, we have y equals 5 times 3 to the power of x. Alrighty then, now for the last thing we have to talk about, growth and decay with exponential functions. Exponential growth means that the value of y, the output, increases as the value of x, which is the input, also increases. The value of b will always be greater than 1 in a growth problem. Decaying functions are the inverse. The value of y will get smaller as the x value increases. The value of b will always be less than 1 in a decaying problem. You'll notice in a growth function, the graph goes up from left to right, and in a decay function, the graph goes down from left to right. When you write these functions out, they always start with y equals a, but then, instead of writing b, you put 1 plus r instead. The letter r stands for the rate by which the function grows, so we have a 1 plus r in parentheses for the growth function. The decay function is just the opposite. Notice how it says 1 minus r instead. You'll notice the growth equation has a plus sign behind the rate r, and the decay function has a minus sign. Those symbols logically go with growth and decay. Growth meaning plus, decay meaning minus. Let's look at a few of these, and I think you'll catch on pretty quickly. Here's example one. Consider the exponential function f of x equals 500 times 1.05 to the power of x, which models the amount of money in Tyler's savings account, where x represents the number of years since Tyler invested the money. The graph of this situation is also shown below. Part A says, is the money growing or decaying? Well, how do you know from the graph it's going up from left to right? So that means growth. How can you tell from the function well, the value of the b part is 1.05, which is greater than 1, which also means growth. Part b asks for the actual rate of growth. Here's how you calculate that. Remember, it's all based on the 1 plus r part, which in this case is 1.05. How would you figure out the actual rate of growth? Well, just solve for the r variable by doing inverse operations. Taking away 1 from both sides leaves you with r equals 0 0.05. We do have to additionally put this answer into percentage form, which you can easily do by moving the decimal point two places to the right, making it 5%, which is the answer. Part C asks for what the 500 represents, and how do you know from the graph? Well, the 500 is the initial amount because on the graph, it's the y-intercept. The initial value is always the y-intercept. We would also know from this function that because the 500 is in the position of the a term, it is the initial value. Let's look at one more of this style of problem so that you can really see the difference between the growth and decay situations. This problem shows us the function 21,000 times 0.91 to the power of x. And part A asks us if this is a growth or decaying function. Since the graph is going down from left to right, we know it's decaying. We can also see that because b equals 0.91, which is less than 1, we know it's decaying. Part B is very important. It's how to calculate the rest of the decay, the rate of the decay. 
Well, we know it comes from the 1 minus r part, which equals 0 0.91. To figure out what the rate r is, just move r to the other side, making it positive r, then subtract 0.91 from both sides to cancel it out. You get a rate of decay that's 0 0.09 which when you move the decimal two places to the right becomes 9%, which is the rate of decay. Think of the number one as the balance point between growth and decay. 0.91 is nine hundredths away from one, meaning it's a 9% decay since it's less than one. Moving on to the meaning of the 21,000, we know that A is the initial value, so that means the cost of the car was originally 21,000. Easy thing to answer. Lastly, we have part D, the meaning of F of 5. Well, since X is the number of years since buying the car, we are going to take the original function, but instead of writing an exponent of X, we're going to put it to the power of 5 on the 0 0.91. And then we have to evaluate it. Now, I'm going to assume you know how to use exponents on a calculator for the sake of time. When you input 0 0.91 and raise it to the power of 5, you get 0 0.62 and then a whole lot of decimals that come after it. Remember that 0 0.91 to the power of 5 means 0 0.91 times 0 0.91 times 0 0.91 times 0 0.91 times 0 0.91, five of them. Just leave that crazy decimal on your calculator screen and hit times 21,000. You should now see 13,104.68, which is the decayed price of the car, which makes sense. The moment you buy a car, it starts losing value the more you drive it. All right, a few more of these and then we'll be done. Example three, you bought an antique desk for $650. Each year, the value appreciates by 5%. Write a function V of T that models the value after T years. Let's knock this one out quickly. We know it's growth because the word appreciates means increases. The antique desk was bought for $650, so that's the initial value A. The rate of 5% means if you move the decimal two places to the left, you would have 0 0.05, which is the number you'll use in the function for the final answer. Next to the 650, put an open parenthesis and then a 1 plus. The rate of 0 0.05 goes after it. And then that gets the power of t in this case because t is representing time in years, not x. But it means the same idea. You'll want to simplify what's in the parentheses for the final answer, meaning 1 plus 0 0.05 equals 1.05. And that's it. So I recommend for this last one that you pause the video and just give it a shot. All right, let's knock, knock this one out real quick. We know it's decay because of the word depreciate. So that means we have the 1 minus r function. A is the initial value. It's 23,000. It's depreciating by 9%, which means 0 0.09 when you move the decimal. So when we write the function out, we have 1 minus 0 0.09, which when you simplify becomes 0.91. And there you have it. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it helped. Go ahead and hit that like button for me. Comment on something if you can, and please subscribe. Have a great day. See you later.